Hey everybody, welcome on the third, uh, let's say, talk, but actually a workshop at the Jamming Rivers session. Uh, I'm happy and extremely satisfied that we will be able to see Jack and Ryan in action. And just to let you know, Jumping Rivers is the platinum sponsor of this year's conference. We are very grateful for their financial support and the help that the conference wouldn't happen without, without their help. And they were also kind enough to provide two uh, supporting grants for women in data science. Um, and um, also Jumping Rivers were sending our us some funds so that we were actually able to also grant some awards for outstanding community leaders uh, in our community. Uh, we will have like 45 minutes of the workshop uh, by Jack and Rian. Uh, get your laptops prepared. And I'm not taking more of your time uh, anymore. And Jack, Rian, the floor is yours. Lovely. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for taking the time out of your day to come to this talk. As my title slide very helpfully reminds me, my name is Jack and I'm here today, who would have thought to deliver a talk? So without further ramblings, let us make a start. So we all know that the first obligatory slide of any talk is of course the about me slide. So here we find ourselves. My background, well, essentially I spent far too long at university, trying to avoid getting an actual job. This might, maybe might, be an experience which some of you can sympathize with. Anyway, whilst avoiding reality, uh, I ended up learning a lot of maths and stats, and in the ultimate move of academic procrastination, ended up getting a PhD in applied maths. Along with that, I also learned to program, primarily in R and Python, but also I made use of the probabilistic programming language STAN. I still use R and Python more or less on a daily basis and STAN sort of more as and when, sort of semi-frequently. As well as these languages, I also make much use of tools such as Docker, Ansible, and Terraform. But despite my best efforts, employment did eventually catch up with me. Uh, but I can now say I am happily employed at Jumping Rivers as a literal jack of all trades. So I perform a sort of mixed data scientist and data engineer role at Jumping Rivers. And uh, I have many other roles, uh, one of which is, of course, holder of tiny novelty checks here. So if you have a tiny novelty check you'd like holding and or spending, uh, please slide into these DMs. I'm sure we can come to some sort of check-based agreement. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's my obligatory about me slide, which of course brings us on to obligatory slide number two, which isn't about me, but about my employer. So I actually stole these bullet points from uh, some previous talks given uh, for Jumping Rivers, uh, but there's actually one, one major bullet point missing from here. So from the ones I already have, you can see that Jumping Rivers are involved in all manner of things, sort of in the more general data science sphere. But there's one point missing, and that is our training offerings. So Jumping Rivers, teach training courses on R, Python, Git, Stan, Scala, and many more. And we have difficulty level ranging from absolute beginner to more advanced topics. And as well as having a number of sort of pre-prepared, ready to roll offerings, we also offer more bespoke training options where we can tailor content to suit your team and your team's outcomes and goals. So that is Jumping Rivers, which means we are here. It's time for content. So why are we here? Well, perhaps a little bit 
of a too broad question for this talk. So let's narrow the focus just a little bit and let's instead consider why are we here at this YR talk? So let's go. I think uh, most of us here will have at least some tangential interest in being able to use R in some production environment. That is, we want to be able to use our R code in some reproducible manner, in some stable manner, and perhaps in some sort of scalable way as well. Apparently, if you came to uh, Colin and Andrew's talks earlier, and if you haven't listened to those yet, I do recommend checking those out. Uh, but if you came to those talks, well, Andrew and Colin said, yeah, we can do it. We can use R in production. And strangers on the internet wouldn't lie to us, right? So of course, we're also here at this talk, hopefully, to try it for ourselves, okay? The proof is in the pudding. Andrew and Colin said, cool, you can use R in production. This talk is gonna have more of a sort of workshop feel. We have prepared a sandbox our studio workbench and our studio connect environment where you guys can really have a go, muck in and see these tools for what they are, proof is in the pudding. So that's why we're here. Let's break down the anatomy of this talk slash workshop a little bit more. Essentially, I've designed this workshop to be made up of two standalone sections. And they've been designed to be standalone so that if you don't quite complete the first example, the first hands-on demo, um, then it doesn't matter. If you don't complete the first one, then you'll still be able to participate in the second example, okay? So we've got these two standalone sections and each of these sections is gonna follow the same similar pattern, okay? So in each of these sections, I will first motivate some desired workflow. And this will be some workflow that we as a developer, as a data scientist might wish to achieve. Having outlined this workflow, which we'd like to achieve, we'll consider some different ways, different possible ways of achieving these desires, okay? After considering these different possible ways, we will then see a live demonstration of me achieving that workflow. A live demonstration, I hear you say, what could possibly go wrong, right? Immortalized forever on the internet. So uh, that should be a good one. Cross them fingers for me. Uh, so yes, I'll demonstrate achieving this workflow, which we want, and then it will be your go. So I will go through a demonstration and then I'll pass it over to you guys to have a crack yourselves. Lovely. So first things first, before we can achieve any of these or discuss any of these workflows, we'll first need to be able to log into and access this sandbox environment. So I'm shortly gonna demonstrate how to do so. What I will say here is you don't need to take any notes as I go through this demonstration. I have included full instructions on the next slide, which will walk you through getting logged in to this sandbox environment, including links and the like, which will also be available in the YouTube description. Okay, but in the meanwhile, if you bear with me, I'm now going to step through this logging in of the sandbox environment. So the first place I'm going to go, and again, links will be made available in the YouTube description uh, and on the next slide, but the URL is yr-pl.jumpinrivers.training forward slash welcome. On this page, I'm here going to submit my email address along with a master password, which we'll all share. And the master password is boysenberry hyphen strawberry. Again, that will be on the next slide and it will be shared in the YouTube live chat, that password for you guys, okay? So I've submitted my email address. 
this master password, boysenberry hyphen strawberry. When I submit these details, I'll be revealed my own username and password to use to access our studio workbench. So here I have been allotted user 34 and I have a user specific password. So when you guys submit your details, you will get your own username and password, but it won't be quite these ones. What I'm gonna do, because I don't want to have to type that password out, I'm gonna copy this into my clipboard for use later. And I'm going, to, um, I'm going to make a note of it as well. I think that will be useful. And I've got a bit of a habit of keeping notes in search windows of new browser tabs. So I'm just going to stick this password here for later, but put that wherever you want, perhaps somewhere more sensible. Anyway, with my username and password revealed, I'm then going to click on this link, which says training environment. This is at the top of the welcome page. When I do so, I'm taken to this sign into our studio page. Here, my username will be the one revealed on the previous page. So I was user 34 and my password was in my clipboard. Okay, so that's the one in my tab over here. I'm gonna click sign in. Okay, I'm gonna be greeted with a page like this. Two more steps, we're almost there. I'm just gonna click the new session button. A dialogue will open with some default settings suggested. I'm going to leave these defaults as they are. I'm gonna hop straight over and click start session. At this point, I'll be greeted with what is hopefully for all of us a familiar looking R Studio IDE. So that is the login process demonstrated, which means it is now your turn. So I have on this slide uh, links to the welcome page and the training machine. Those links can also be found in the YouTube description. I also have the master password there as well. If you get stuck at any point, please just drop a message in the YouTube chat and either I or one of my colleagues, most likely Rian, will be able to come and assist you. Uh, if you get logged in before the five minutes are up, please as well, just drop us a line in the YouTube chat so we know that we can move on. Let's reconvene in five minutes. Thank you. See you all shortly. Super. So we've already got um, a couple of people managed to log in, I can see, which is fantastic. I managed to get my login as well. Um, have you ever tried a boysenberry, Jack? No, um, I couldn't even tell you what a boysenberry <laughs> looks like, Rianne. A strawberry, however, I'm more familiar with. More familiar with the strawberry. <laughs> okay, yeah, we've got a couple of people managed to log in, which is excellent. Okay, looks like it's all going well. We've had another couple of people log in, which is great. Lovely. And for those that haven't seen um, this sort of our studio um, setup before, Jack, tell us a little bit about what we're using at the moment, actually, Workbench itself. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, as Rianne said, here we are using our studio Workbench, formerly known as our Studio Server Pro. And essentially, it's much like an R Studio IDE, but it's living in the cloud somewhere here. So this is one of our Studio's enterprise products. A really great product. We use it a lot internally. It is also the environment where we perform all of our online training. So if you come to a Jumping Rivers course, it's not just slides and somebody talking. It's a sandbox training environment where everybody can log in and you can run our code. 
So everybody gets a login here. You can run code, we can pre-install packages, pre-upload content and so on. Right, looks like everyone's good, Jack. Should we shift on to the demo? Lovely, yes, of course. Okay, yeah, great. So uh, we're now ready for our first demonstration, but let's have a little bit of motivation first. So in this example, we're going to imagine a hopefully not too far-fetched scenario that we have some shiny application, which we can run locally, but we'd like to be able to share this application with others. Now, others here could be my colleagues, it could be clients, or it could just be the wider internet. Okay, but the, the central problem is local application, I want to put it somewhere where others can use it. There are a number of possible solutions here. The first solution, which I'll mention, is akin to Andrew's mystery roll your own solution, as discussed in his seven steps to reliable and maintainable infrastructure talk. So this solution will give us a great amount of freedom, but it does take a fair bit of know-how, okay? For a start, we need some familiarity and confidence working with Docker, and we also need to be familiar with cloud providers and their offerings, okay? But a lot of freedom, but a fair bit of setup. Another solution, of course, is to use Shiny Apps IO. Shiny Apps IO is a very simple solution um, for people who don't need any complex authentication mechanisms. They don't need integrations with data sources. And if you only want to host applications, then Shiny Apps IO is a great possible solution. The third option here is our Studio Connect. So our Studio Connect, as mentioned by Andrew, is our studio's enterprise grade hosting platform. And it allows users to host many different types of content. So shiny applications, as we will see, is just one type of content we can host, but we can also host our Markdown documents, we can host Plumber APIs, we can host Flask applications, and much, much more. Out of the box, our Studio Connect supports content scaling and multiple authentication providers. Okay. So let me demonstrate here, publishing an application from our Studio Workbench to our Studio Connect. The workflow I will demonstrate will be very similar, if not practically identical, if you were just working from a local a Studio IDE, okay? So the implementation detail here of using our Studio Workbench isn't particularly important. If we were on a local our Studio IDE, we'd be able to publish in the same manner up to our Studio Connect, okay? So I've got a demonstration here. Same as before, I'll walk us through the steps and then on the next slide, I'll have instructions for you guys to replicate these steps. So now that I'm logged in, I'm going to go back onto our Studio Workbench and I'm going to navigate into the Cat in a Box folder in my File Browser tab in the bottom right of our Studio. And from there, I'm just going to open up the file ui.r. Lovely, ui.r is here. What I'm gonna do now is to publish this application up to our Studio Connect. That's gonna be super easy to do. There is this blue little icon in my file editor, which you can see, which I will press. And I'm going to walk through some steps here for our initial connection to our Studio Connect. So once we've connected Workbench to connect once for our user, we won't have to walk through these steps again. But the first connection has a couple of more boxes for us to click. So I'm now going to connect to our Studio Connect. I'm going to follow these on-screen prompts. Okay. You'll see that I'm also asked whether I want to 
connect to Shiny AppsIO. Here, we're going to select our Studio Connect, and we can accept this uh, default publishing server here, YRPL Jumping Rivers Training. So again, we just hit Next. Now, in a new browser window, what's going to pop up is an R Studio Connect login page. So the username and password I will use here are those ones which I usefully made a note of, okay, in my browser tab here. So I was U034 and boysenberry strawberry U034. So I'm going to authenticate here and finally click this connect button. Okay. At this point, I can head back to our studio workbench and we can see now that my account has now been verified against our studio connect. Again, those extra steps, we only have to walk through once on our first connection. Great. So all that's left now is to hit the publish button and we'll wait just a minute. And what's going to happen now is my application which I had running on Workbench is going to be published up to our Studio Connect, okay? So here we have our very scientific, which cat are you personality test. As it currently stands, this is only accessible to me, but through this access tab, I can now change the sharing settings to make this accessible to anyone on the internet. So I've clicked sharing settings, anyone, no login required, and hit save. At this point, I can now share this URL with any of my colleagues so I can find out what cat they are. Lovely. So that is publishing an application from our Studio Workbench to our Studio Connect and making it accessible to the wider internet. That's my demonstration complete, which means Lucky for you guys, it's now yoga. So I've got five steps below. As before, if at any point you get stuck, please just drop a line in the YouTube chat and Rianne will be able to come and assist. I'm going to suggest around 10 minutes for you guys to have a crack at this. But once again, if you finish early or you finish before those 10 minutes are up, please again, just drop us a line in the chat so I know we're done and we can move on to the next bit. Let's reconvene in 10. Thank you very much. So I'm guessing we might not actually need the full 10 minutes, but while we're chatting here, so this, this is just a standard Shiny app. So we've got a, a UI, a server and a global, and you can open any of those, right? So you can click the publish button from any of those R scripts. Yep, that's exactly right. I chose UI.R for my example, but any of those R scripts will work perfectly for the publication. And there was um, another button, wasn't there, when we looked at the access. So there was sort of private which is you know, literally just you. And then there was everyone, which is the whole wide world. And there's an intermediate one as well, right? Yeah, that's right. So we can control access at multiple levels. And what we can do quite easily is to add individual R Studio Connect users to particular content items. And a really useful feature, which we use a lot internally, is to add groups of users to content. So for example, we have sort of an internal Jumping Rivers Connect group, which we add to a lot of our content. And we add all our users who work at Jumping Rivers to this one group. So we can easily grant access to multiple people at the same time. So that's a really nice feature. And the other nice feature about that actually is that you, there are, as far as I recall, two main options, sort of viewer, someone who can just see the app and the basics and then there's also an editor and that's someone who can um, not only view the app but they can also change the more complicated administration settings such as who else can access it and some of the other features that you might talk about later yeah exactly so it's really nice you've got this user model where some people can only view the content but then you have these higher levels of privilege where you can have 
other people also come in and edit that content uh, and change change its settings as well. Uh, the only frustrating thing is, though, with that, if you are an editor, you do get emails if your um, if your shiny app fails to deploy, um, which is quite frustrating when you're in a group. It can be quite embarrassing when you try and deploy your app, and not only does it fail, but it emails all of your colleagues to tell you that it failed. Um, <laughs> No better motivation to get it fixed, though. Or to get it right first time. <laughs> yes. Well, one can dream. Um, looks like a couple of people have managed to deploy that successfully, Jack. So while other people are catching up, it might be worth just moving on to the next demo. Yeah, of course. Well, I hope you've all found out what catch you are. And again, I say our completely scientific uh, personality test, which we've uh, hacked together for you there. So that was demonstration one, which means we're all ready to move on to demonstration two. So another desired workflow, another similar pattern to what we saw previously. So in this desired workflow, in this scenario, we're imagining that I have some R code. Uh, perhaps it's R code which takes some input data and generates a plot. Perhaps it involves a fitted model which takes some data and output some predictions. But either way, I have some R code and I'd like others to be able to make use of it without requiring them to have an entire R installation and all of the necessary R packages installed. Okay, So I kind of want to put this R code where others can use it, but without requiring them to install R. Essentially, what I'm sort of describing here is an API, right? I want somewhere where I can host some code and have other people sort of talk to that code. They can send requests to it and they can receive responses. That's what I'm working toward here. It was mentioned briefly in Andrew's talk, uh, but there is an R package called Plumber, which can be used to really painlessly turn R code into APIs. And essentially the way we do so is by decorating our code. Okay, sounds very Christmassy, doesn't it? If um, you've used the Roxygen 2 package, a package which is used for sort of automatically generating documentation, then you'll be familiar with the idea of what decoration looks like. But essentially much as with Roxygen 2, with Plumber, we add some extra decorations around our functions and Plumber can turn these functions into APIs for us. So great, we can now make these APIs, but we need to be able to put it somewhere for others to access, okay? Where shall we put it? There's actually a great companion package with Plumber called Plumber Deploy which has or gives us some ability to automatically deploy our Plumber APIs up to a number of different cloud-based providers. Um, it's mainly targeted at DigitalOcean, but we can also use other cloud-based providers too. There is also a RStudio maintained Docker image, RStudio Plumber, which we could use along with some generic container hosting services. This is kind of going down the sort of roll your own route again, which Andrew mentioned in his talk. So we could use this Docker image and then just sort of anywhere we can host Docker images, any cloud providers which give that as a service, we can put our Dockerized API up there. The Plumber documentation actually is really thorough and has some good talks some good instructions apologies, which walk us, the developer, through a variety of different hosting options. The easiest way, by far, of course, will be to publish to our Studio Connect. And being a big proponent of taking the easy way out, that's exactly what I'm going to demonstrate here. Okay, so my next demonstration is going to be publishing a Plumber API from our Studio Workbench to our Studio Connect, and then demonstrating pulling this API. Okay, same setups before. The next slide will have instructions for you guys, but 
right now, I will be walking through this publish procedure. So I'm back over onto my R Studio Workbench session. In the file browser in the bottom right, I'm going to navigate back up to my home directory and this time into the Hadley as a service folder. There's only two files in here and I'm gonna open up the file called plumber.r. Again, I'm gonna make use of this blue publish to connect button and it's gonna be a bit more pain free this time as we've already authenticated against connect those credentials that authentication will be cached and it will be almost two buttons pretty much to publish this so i've hit the publish button and publish once again it's going to take just a second for this to appear okay i get a pop-up blocked warning but if i just click try again i will now have my api open up on connect Great, I'm gonna do a couple of things here. Firstly, I'm going to change the access to this API. So by default, we have specific users or groups. I'm gonna bump past the all users, which is anybody who can log in to this connect service. And I'm gonna bump up to anybody whatsoever, the wider internet. I'm gonna expose Hadley to here. So I'm gonna save that change and I'm going to make one more change here as well. Okay, so this is a change we didn't make for our cat app, but it's one I'm going to make here and that is to set a custom content URL. So by default, we have this rather long URL for accessing this API, but I'd like some a bit more catchy. So I'm going to use the customize option here and I'm gonna set my custom URL to Hadley, okay? Again, I make this change and then I hit save. I can now copy this full URL. So it's just gonna be yr-pl.jumpingrivers.training slash Hadley, okay? This API is now accessible to anybody on the internet and has a nice custom URL rather than this long unique identifier. Great, so that's published. Let us just show now that we can pull this API. So I'm back on our Studio Workbench here. I'm gonna make my requests with the HTTR package. And at first, I'm just going to make a GET request. So HTTR GET, and that is my endpoint. I've got a status 200 response, which is looking good. So once I've done my HTTR get, I'm just gonna wrap it with a HTTR content, which will show me what was actually passed back from my API. Lovely, okay, so you can see now my HTTR content, HTTR get is returning me some data from my endpoint, which is here. Uh, a quote from Hadley himself. One more thing I'll show you before I hand it over is pulling this endpoint from outside of R. So the whole point is you don't need to have R to pull this endpoint. And I showed you that by pulling it in R, maybe not the most convincing demonstration. So I'm actually gonna open just a terminal here in our studio. And I'm going to use the command line utility curl to create a get request. Okay, so it's curl big X get yr hyphen pl jumping rivers dot training slash Hadley. Okay, and you can see I really can get some response from some R code from an environment which isn't R. Okay, lovely. So that's my demonstration for my Hadley in a box example completed, which of course means it is now your turn. So five more steps here. I'll give us again around 10 minutes, but we'll be watching the chat, seeing if problems are coming up 
and moving on once you guys have done. So let's reconvene in sort of five, 10 minutes. So we've only got about five minutes actually left on this workshop. So we'll just spend, I guess, five minutes on this. Um, I have an important update for you, Jack. Um, Please. We've got um, a, a good spread of cats. I'm a do dopey cat, as I think you probably already know. But we've got a couple more dopey, chat, dopey cats in the chat. Um, a couple of bashful ones and one, one grumpy cat as well. One grumpy cat. One lone grumpy cat. Um, we also had a question from Gerard about more sort of generic, a uh, more generic plumber question, which was, is it possible to scale up plumber APIs multi-threaded? Um, Andrew's already kind of pointed out in the chat that as of um, Plumber 1.0, there is there are async um, features, um, and he suggested sort of Dockerizing Plumber and using like Shiny Proxy or Kubernetes to scale out. Um, I know I've also managed to do some stuff with the Future Package as well. Yeah, really good question, and basically thanks Rian for answering that one for me. <laughs> Saved me some trouble there. Yes, I know we've actually made use of the async functionality of Plumber in client projects as well. It's not just something we've experimented with behind doors. I know that's something um, clients have wanted in the past and we've implemented as well. And what is your favorite Hadley quote, Jack? Well, we actually already saw it. Um, this one took a lot of digging up, actually. It was a Stack Overflow quote. Well, I've got all the obvious ones from the books and such, um, but there's a good Stack Overflow one I like. Um, when Hadley responded to himself several years later after saying that global variables was a hideous hack and he'd never use it ever, he responded a few years later saying, um, <laughs> that it changed his mind, basically. Never say never. So I, that was a, a nice find. Great. Um, we should wrap up, Jack. Um, any last question, um, thoughts about, I guess we're going to make sure this VM is going to be up at least over the weekend. So if anyone yes. wants to play, they can do. Yeah, exactly. Um, we'll leave this up over the weekend. If you want to play around, go for it. I'll give a super quick summary and a super quick follow-up slide just to finish up. Uh, so hopefully I've shown here that our Studio Connect is sort of a batteries included as opposed to Andrew's batteries excluded solution earlier for content hosting, scaling, and authentication. If you like what you see, you're intrigued and want to see a little bit more, we'll jump in rivers off a hassle-free, no strings attached, 45-day free trial our Studio Connect. So if this is something you're interested in, I've said it before, I'll say it again, slide into those DMs. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for listening. That's it from me. I hope you all have a great day.